I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and we will read the opening 11 verses, verses 1 through 11. This is God's word. Let us give careful attention to its reading. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And that ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, all of your word is precisely that. It is the word of God. Here we feel like we are on a certain special holy ground and that these are the very words spoken by the Son of God while he was on earth to his 11 faithful disciples who would be apostles. Lord, would you give the Spirit, even as we have prayed already through song, Spirit of God, you who had the Apostle John write these words, would you now be at work in our midst this day, writing the truth of these things upon our hearts? It is, O Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Hudson Taylor was the founder of China Inland Mission. He did his work largely in the the latter part of the the 1800s, the mid and and latter part of the 1800s, and uh, responsible for leading hundreds of missionaries into China's interior for the first time. Uh, He had a son, Frederick uh, Taylor, and he wrote about his dad. And he wrote us certainly about how his dad entered a certain phase of his ministry personally, and it continued through his life. Uh, Here's a quote from his son as he's speaking of his father. He said, here was a man almost 60 years of age, bearing tremendous burdens, yet absolutely calm and untroubled. He says, oh, the pile of letters, any one of which might contain news of death, of lack of funds, of riots, of serious trouble. Yet, all, not probably not like my desk or yours, he says, all were opened, read, and answered with the same tranquility. Christ, his reason for peace, his power for calm, dwelling in Christ, he drew upon his very being and resources. And this he did by an attitude of faith as simple as it was continuous. Yet he was delightfully free and natural. I can find no words to describe it save the scriptural expression in God. He was in God all the time, in God in him. It was that true abiding of John 15. My guess is you have read perhaps many times John 15 and we find ourselves here 
in our sermon expositions of John chapters 13 through 17. These are tremendous words. Just a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was three weeks ago, we had <clears throat> the conclusion of John 14, and it ends where the Lord looks at his disciples and says, Rise, let us go from here. Most people think precisely that. They have left that upper room. They are walking on that path that will lead them ultimately to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he will pray and be taken captive. And somewhere along the way, perhaps because they see vineyards or, or who knows for all the reasons, but the Lord enters into further instruction to his, to his disciples here. He's in chapters 15 and 16, what we're going to encounter is, whereas chapter 14 was largely about comfort and some promises, we're going to find the Lord speaking about how his disciples and us will minister in this world, how they will relate first of all to him, how we are to relate to one another, how we are to go into this world, how we will have the Holy Spirit's help, what our future will be. Those things will be covered in these next two uh, chapters. This is not a parable that he speaks here. It is really an extended illustration, a metaphor perhaps. A metaphor is a figure of speech that describes an object or action in a way that's not literally true, but it helps explain the idea. And that's what he's doing here, and that's what you're familiar with. Uh, we, we understand that we're talking here about life, about strength, about infusion of ability. And so I want to, uh, and yet that's very important, I want to do something which I hope is simple. I want us to stand back uh, and take a look at that one basic concept of life and then I want to take the time to explain the parts of this illustration and then of course apply it. So let's stand back, this overarching reality and what I want to make sure we say, because I was reading D.A. Carson's book on this, and he said, as he started his treatment of this section, he said, this is one of the most well-known passages of all Scripture, and yet superficially known. There's tremendous statements here. So I want us to stand back and, first of all, make this point, that any and all true human life, according to the Bible, that is real life, true life has always been characterized by relationship and communion with God. You need to let that thought sink in. All real life, real human life, has always been meant to be lived in communion with the living God. Go all the way back to the garden. Genesis 1 through 3, you know the creation account. You know the creation of Adam and Eve and their, union, their marriage there. You know about sin entering in. And in chapter 3, there is this hint of what they enjoyed before sin entered in. It is in Genesis 3, 8. It says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves. Well, they hid themselves because of shame and, and the sin that they'd done. But did you see, do you hear that? that from the very beginning, human life was to be lived in relationship and communion with God. Matter of fact, there are four, there are four relationships that I think really define life. When the scripture says to live, I think it means you've got four relationships intact. One is your relationship with God is real and vibrant. Your relationship to one another is as it's supposed to be. There's a relationship to myself of inner integrity and wholeness and relationship to the world. Did you note how in the garden sin disrupted all four of those? Sin disrupted their relationship with God. It disrupted their relationship with one another. They start accusing them. Adam says, the woman you gave me. And she says, well, the this, this, uh, snake here, he, he deceived me. And so suddenly they're pointing fingers at one another. So that relationship is disrupted. They ha now have shame and guilt inside. So they're in 
eternal integrity is disrupted. And what is the curse? The curse is, oh, you can go out into the world and guess what? It's going to yield thorns and thistles and all of this by the sweat of your brow. All of that is disrupted. And that's why you know the, the statement there. Don't eat of that tree for you shall die. Die is not non-existence. It's broken relationships all over the place. And of course, the scriptures will end in Revelation with precisely the fullness of all four of those restored ultimately. But the Lord here is basically teaching us about life. And there is this promise of communion with him. Abide in me and I in you. It's this issue of union with Christ. And so as we come to a conclusion of this first point, we don't really understand our day-to-day -day existence, our life on this earth, until we understand it as the moment-by-moment -moment union and communion with the triune God of the Bible. Wherever we're going, whatever we are doing, whether we're changing diapers, doing grocery shopping, whether we are at work, whether we are playing sports, studying at UConn, studying at school, whatever we're doing, we are, if we are the children of God, we do these things, we are to do these things in a vital union with the God of heaven and earth, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your life, therefore, has dignity. It has purpose. It makes a difference for eternity. And so, as we look at this well-known section of Scripture, we want to see the magnitude of what the Lord is talking about. So, let's go then and let's just take a look at the parts of this illustration. There are three parts, so to speak, three parties in it, you might say. And the first, Jesus, his opening statement, I am the true vine. This is the seventh and the last of the I am statements in the Gospel of John. All seven of those statements reveal much about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as, I, just as we repeat them, you'll say, yes, this this is who Jesus is. This is what he's accomplished. This is the, his greatness. Why, why, he is the bread of life. This issue of life again. He is the light of the world. He's that door through which I can come and, and find protection and safety. He's that good shepherd. He's the resurrection and what? And the life. And then we found in John 14, he is the way and the truth and what? And the life. And now here, he is this vine. But he says the true vine. And I think he says the true vine largely because of why we read Isaiah from chapter 5. The, any Jew would understand the use of a vineyard and vine to refer to the nation of Israel and really what Israel was supposed to do and be. But every account in which Israel is referred to as a vine in the Old Testament is a, an account which picks up on their failure, on judgment, on condemnation because they failed at this calling of God to be fruitful in the world, to be those that would bear the name of God there. And so the Lord comes now, and in that simple word, I am the true vine, he is the fulfillment of what Israel was supposed to be. He is also saying that he will be the source of fruitful life. He is our vine. J.C. Ryle, speaking of this, says, Jesus, in, in kind of fleshing out these words, he says, I am the true source of all your life and spiritual vigor. And you are, very important words, we'll pick up on them again later, you are entirely dependent on me as the branches of the vine are on the parent stem. There is a close union between you and me, as between a vine and its branches. And he goes on with those things. But that's the, that is what our Lord is saying. 
He is the fulfillment of all that Israel was supposed to be. And now, instead of a national connection, it will be those who trust in him, who depend upon him, who come to him, saying, give me life, that are branches that are linked into him. Well, the second person here is the father. He says, the father is the vine dresser. Every, some of you actually work in vineyards around here. I know some in, uh, in North Carolina that do as well. And any good vineyard's got to have uh, somebody who cares for it. And the father is the vine dresser here. He's described as doing two things. You'll see it. He takes away and he prunes. What does he take away? He takes away branches that bear no fruit. Lack of fruit is evidence of separation from the vine. There is no vital connection between the dead branch and the vine. This is not teaching. Some of you have studied this text, and you'll note that it actually says, every branch in me um, he takes away. Um, and this is not teaching a loss of salvation. I think this is the best way to understand that, this statement, is precisely what we saw earlier in John chapter 13. They're in the upper room. Twelve are there. What happens? Judas departs. What did Judas appear like throughout the ministry with the Lord? He appeared to be one of, one of the twelve. He appeared to be a as faithful as them. He was able to, to hide the, through hypocrisy and whatever means the ability to convince the other disciples that he was one of them. But he never was. And that's true still today. People can fool one another. Churches are generally some, at some level a mixture of those that are true branches and those that only appear so. Our Lord knows the truth. There is no fooling him. And so he takes those and removes them from his vineyard. But the other thing that is here is that he prunes every branch that is bearing fruit. The purpose of pruning, by the way, is also clearly stated. That it may bear more fruit. Now you're sitting here probably thinking, Lord, can't you leave me alone? Uh, do you, do you, because pruning is this idea. Uh, this is one of those things. Cecilia's got to be laughing a little bit in her heart right now because for nearly 35 years of marriage, she's tried to get me to understand gardening. And, and uh, she's failed. She'll, uh, she'll say, now, Bill, what kind of flower is this? And I'll say, it's a yellow one. <laughs> and... Uh, or, or what kind of is, is that? Well, it's a purple one. And she's trying to get me, anyway. So, I don't know a lot about these things. Matter of fact, I would probably kill most plants. That, but, but I do know this, I do know that gardening and, and in the vineyard, you cut plants back, and it is really true. They, in the next season of growth, grow better and bear more fruit. But the cutting, gives us, it, it leads in, first of all, to a subject that's a little too big for today's sermon, but it is a very important subject. Here we have the Lord giving in this picture the reason for God's discipline in your life. Some of his sovereign occasions of pain and discomfort. He prunes Part of the reason we read from Ephesians 2 today, we're very familiar with um, the statement that um, for by grace you have been saved by faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. We, we, we revel in that. Verse 10 is not as well known, but the saving work of God is for this purpose. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Always in Scripture, we see this interest in perfection, in maximizing fruitfulness, and this quality of godliness. We're speaking here of God's interest in your sanctification, your growth, your further departure from sin, and your further love for holiness, for Him, and for, for His kingdom, for the great concerns that He has. He will take away whatever inhibits growth. It may be in our parenting, it may be in our relationship with our spouses, it may be in uh, needing to have grow in personal integrity in the workplace, wherever it is, maybe through sickness and grief. All of these things, those passages like Hebrews 12 and 1 Peter chapter 1 and James chapter 1, count it all joy when we encounter various trials, brother, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have it, and it goes on. Those kinds of verses our Lord summarizes here in the Father prunes fruitful branches. Okay, so let's come to the branches. Two kinds of branches are mentioned. I've already referred to them, but I think it's important because the scripture here that we have read shows us this to be very important. There, there is, of course, the unfruitful branches that are referred to in the first part of verse 2 and in uh, verse 6. They are obviously characterized by bearing no fruit. They are dead, being separated from the vine. But note, note in verse 6 how our Lord makes very clear what happens to them. It's a step-by-step -step process. They're thrown away like a branch. They wither. Just like any uh, a floral arrangement may look wonderful sitting on your table. Those stems are cut and disconnected from life, and they will eventually wither. And the branches are gathered. It doesn't say who gathers necessarily, but they are gathered. They are thrown into the fire and burned. That has to be a reference to eternal judgment. It has to be. Those images of fire and burning and the gathering we could go to other texts and see that. And we need to note that it is Jesus who is saying these things. And I want us to see this, this, this significant point. Is it because they did great crimes in life, did, did horrible things? No. According to this illustration, it is simply the conviction and practice, I can live my life independent of Christ, not dependent. I'll live my life apart from him. I'll live my life independently of him. I will not seek life from him. I believe I can do it on my own. Such a simple, basic life choice. And our Lord says, you are an unfruitful branch. And there is a destination for you. But let's spend some time on us, fruitful branches. And we note the description here. It, it, it is interesting. This issue of fruit is, is brought out several times. In verse 2, well, they bear fruit. In verse 2 also, he's going to prune that they might bear more fruit. And it, uh, in verse 4, it's uh, mentioned again that they bear much fruit. In verse 5, and so fruit, more fruit, much fruit, what is this fruit? Well, I think ultimately it is devotion to God. It is living in a manner pleasing to him. You saw, we read a reference about hearing the word of God and following his commands, seeing our lives more and more conformed to that of Christ himself. And we want to hear that this comes as a command to us. Note our responsibility here. He says in verse 4, you are clean. It's kind of like in John 13, where Peter was wanting to have his whole body washed, and Jesus said, well, no, you're already clean. You're already washed. And so these are branches, and they are fruitful, but he's giving them a command to abide. And so what does this mean then? To abide in Christ 
is the active, intentional cultivation by every professing Christian of a living spiritual relationship to Christ. Living in the daily exercise, you might say, of saving faith. It is a simple concept, but do you understand the cultivation of it? The intentionality that's here. We are to cling to Christ, to seek to have an attitude of trying to stick fast to Him, to live a life of close and intimate communion with Him. That is what is being promised here. From the garden to Revelation 22, spiritual life is communion, a relationship with the living God. And here, specifically with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand the importance of this. Jesus in this text makes it extremely important. Look at the end of verse 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Here it comes. For apart from me you can do what? nothing. That's exactly what the English says. It's exactly what the Greek says. Now we know that a lot can be done. People drive cars, people make, you know, you know that that's not what he's referring to. But he is making a point of urgency. If you are going to bear fruit before the Father, if you're going to be fruitful do those things that are pleasing to him. You must be drawing life from me. We are not independent. We are utterly dependent upon God in Christ for life. The positive statement of this is Philippians 4.13, where Paul has learned, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There it is in that positive statement. He, he, he acknowledges the relationship, the union, right? Christ himself is at work in the Apostle Paul. Christ currently is strengthening me. Therefore, I can do all those things that, that the situation demands according to God's leading and providence and what his calling is an apostle and such as that and bear fruit. So what we have here is of absolute importance. And this is why you have all of those expressions, particularly in the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms. We studied in our Wednesday afternoon group, Psalm 42, and in those opening verses, this is why it reads, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? You see this hunger that's there, this, this conviction that... I must be in relationship with God. That, that is of supreme importance. And we have as well here in this text the primary means, a great means that God has given, and it is his word. The Lord says that it is his word that basically prunes as well. As we come to a conclusion, we are saying here that union with Christ is the condition of all fruitfulness in your life that God values. We need to hear that. And we need to hear that it comes as a challenge to us, as a command. As a, uh, that's, there is this intentional cultivation that's there. But are you hearing that in the command, the Lord saying, abide in me. Do you hear the gracious invitation? The open door. The promise that is in that. He says in verse 4, abide in me and what? And I in you. He keeps going. 
Verse 5, I'm the vine, you're the... Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. This is good news. The God of heaven revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ is inviting you today to continue living in close communion with him. He is inviting you into the work of his kingdom. He is inviting you into, we're, we're going to spend more time on this next week. There'll be some repercussions of, from, from this. There'll be some wonderful blessings that come to us if we will simply hear the invitation of the Lord to come and abide in him. A.W. Tozier wrote, The world is perishing for lack of the knowledge of God, and the church is famishing for want of of his presence. I wonder if that's true. I wonder if that's true here for this church. I don't really believe it is. I wonder if it's true for your life. You may be a child of God here today, but here's this invitation from the Lord. There's nothing over here, but there is fullness and fruitfulness and the invitation if you will come and abide in me. You may be here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus. This may sound just completely strange to you. Here, though, if that is true, you would be one of these unfruitful branches. And to you as well, the invitation comes from a gracious Lord. You can be cleaned, pruned, brought into the family of God by simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who lived the life you couldn't live, who died the death, death you deserve, paying for your sins. And the invitation comes, abide in me. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, so much, so much hecticness, busyness in our lives. Every one of us can confess to these things. So much distraction, so much intrusion by the voices of the world. Forgive us when we have just put ourselves in some type of mechanical mode of being and just getting up at the alarm clock and going through the paces until our head hits the pillow at night with little thought for you. Let us hear, Lord, the good news. Yet yeah, it is important news. There is an urgency to it. We can do nothing apart from you. But let us hear the invitation afresh this day that you are here saying, I will give you life and oh, so much more in that life. Give us faith to respond to you, the living and the present Christ. Amen. Our final hymn is an old hymn, one of the ones, turn there, 646. Number 646. You'll see this is attributed to Bernard of Clairvaux in the 1100s. But it's one of those hymns, and you'll see at the title of the page, it's in this category of the hymn book, Love for Christ. It's one of these classic expressions and prayers of how we should long for him. So let's stand and sing number 646.